Hi everyone, I'm Dave Serino and welcome to our apiary here in the Litchfield Hills of Northwest Connecticut. It's August 12th. Uh, it's a bit humid today. Uh, it's starting to get cloudy, about 80 degrees right now. Um, but still think it's a good day for, for us to, to conduct a hive inspection. We are in the second of our two yards that are uh, both of which are on our on our property and are adjacent to our home. The first yard is smaller than uh, than the one we're standing in. Consists of five uh, hives that are uh, have have overwintered multiple years, and they provide all the genetics for everything that we're going to see uh, up here uh, today, including the hive that we're going to look at. Um, five of the hives up here. Uh, out of the nine that exist in this yard uh, overwintered from last year and they have double supers honey supers on they're loaded with honey it's been a good it's been a good uh, season and great flow um, and uh, we'll be extracting in a couple weeks the remaining hives uh, that are up here uh, three are splits and uh, one is a, a, a swarm which I captured so, uh, with that said, I want to get into the uh, to the to some of the cons associated with uh, with this particular uh, with our with our two yards. One, uh, you know, we are in a somewhat residential neighborhood, uh, so I have to be very cognizant of of uh, swarm management in the spring. Um, not just in the spring, you know, we are actually approaching. Uh, a time where there's a kind of a real a small window where you might get a uh, fall uh, mini fall swarm season so we're we're watching out for that right now too but our neighbors love the fact that we have bees uh, but we have to be mindful that uh, not everyone you know is wants thousands of bees in their yard so we do want to be mindful of swarming um, I had mentioned this is a four and a half acre property which is wonderful but uh, we do have um, uh, limited open area. Most of our property is wooded, uh, and a, a large section of it has a uh, has a marsh. Um, but for the most part, uh, we are utilizing almost all of the really available open space. So uh, I would say, um, you know, that's a little bit of a negative in that uh, we can. Uh, we can uh, probably only have about a total of 20, uh, 20 to 25 hives maximum here uh, at this at this location. Um, and that's about it for the negatives. Um, other than, well, I you know I guess we could call it a negative if we uh, if we if we want to uh, uh, if we want to include the the uh, the five wire electric fence that we had to construct around both yards. Um, to keep our, our four-legged friends um, away from the hives. Uh, we, there, there are a significant amount of bears in this particular area of Connecticut, uh, and we enjoy seeing them. Uh, they come by quite often. Uh, we have not had any issues with them here whatsoever, uh, but uh, that's because, uh, most likely because we put up a, a 12,000 volt five wire electric fence around all the hives. So that is an added expense that we had to incur at the outset, but it, you know once it's once the labor's you know uh, completed and the and the expense is incurred, you know it's not a, it's not a negative anymore. So in terms of pros, um, number one, there's a lot of floral diversity here in this particular area. Uh, we've got we've got orchards nearby. We have. Uh, um, because of, of the extensive hundreds of acres of woods that are present adjacent to us, uh, there's a lot of early season pollen. Um, it's somewhat, you know, residential slash rural area. There's a lot of plantings. Uh, the bees have a lot of choices uh, right now. You know, at this point in time, uh, the the uh, loose strife and the goldenrod are um, starting to ramp up. So. That's the majority of what we've seen coming into the hives um, over the course of the last week. Um, another positive, I would say, is actually the proximity of the yards to our house. I can keep an eye on things if 
there's not a day that goes by that I can't be out here if I need to be. Uh, I, I inspect, I open up the hives every 10 to 14 days during the summer, but uh, if I need to just come out uh, and I and I do this nearly every day. I'll just come out, take a look at the, you know, I'll stand near the the entrance, the hive entrance, and I'll just, you know, I'll watch for a few minutes, you know, in front of each hive uh, or at the side of each hive, and um, monitor uh, what's happening, and, and and it gives me a very good idea of uh, of what's going on inside the hive without actually opening it up. Um, so that's definitely a positive. Uh, also, we have um, also we have uh, uh, extensive amount of uh, of water on the property. Um, it's we're high and dry here at you know at the in the particular yards. We're 1,200 feet, so um, dry here and and uh, good drainage. Everything flows away from the hives and down into the marsh. So we have uh, we have a uh, um, beautiful running stream. Um, just down below here, 500 feet away, and also we have extremely large marsh. So even in times of drought, we have uh, plenty of water available uh, very close by. <clears throat> okay, um, I want to make sure I mention record keeping. Um, whether you have one hive, two hives, or 14 hives like we do, um, keeping notes, taking notes, um, recording your observations are very important. Um, you know, I sometimes I could, if I don't take notes, I could say, "Hey, uh, was that in the was that in the uh, in the in the bottom deep or was that in the top deep?" Um, you know, which hive did I see that in? You know, so you want to uh, you, you don't think that you're going to remember everything that you see once you get inside and you go to write it down. Write it down out in the field. So I have a field tablet that I write down uh, notes in as I see them, and then I transfer that um, into a more permanent logbook. So I have a record um, of everything that I see in these hives. There's no other way to really, you know, manage your hives properly without without good record keeping. Okay. Um, so. Before we actually approach the hive we're going to inspect, I want to uh, talk for a moment about um, our approach to um, Varroa management, that is our, our integrated pest management program uh, regarding Varroa. So first off, I, I want to say that everything that we do um, is based upon monthly monitoring, monthly mite monitoring. Uh, I do sugar shakes. Uh, that's the method that I that I prefer. Um, if we reach a threshold in a particular month, so up until this point, and now we're in August, up until this point, that threshold has been uh, two mites per 100 bees. Now we've entered the threshold of three mites uh, per 100 bees. So um, everything everything we do, all our treatment methods, based upon. Uh, based upon um, mite monitoring. Uh, so the first method that I wanna call attention to that, 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 I, that I utilize is uh, oxalic acid vaporization. So in, in the late fall uh, or in the uh, very late winter, those are the two times a year when I would tend to uh, utilize the oxalic acid vaporization technique. Um, it's great for uh, phoretic mites, it does not penetrate the brood cappings, so it does not kill reproductive mites. So uh, it also, um, it's a great, it's, it, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, when we get into the cold weather, there's not a lot of brood present, and you don't really want to go into the hive and disturb them at that point. Uh, you don't have to open up the hive to treat with oxalic acid if you're using the vaporization method. Um, so it's a it's a great option for cold weather treatment. It's effective um, at lower temperatures, but we just have to remember that um, that uh, it has limitations and that it does not penetrate the the, the, the brood cappings. Um, from from there, from spring through the summer, uh, 
I really like Formic Pro. So uh, Formic Pro uh, is kind of my uh, go-to when I need to treat. Uh, and uh, the reason for that being, you can use it with supers on and, uh, you, and it penetrates brood cappings. So not only does it kill phoretic mites, but it also kills reproductive mites. It's one of the very few products that's out there that will actually penetrate brood cappings and kill uh, reproduct and, and kill reproductive mites. So it, it basically gives a lot of flexibility in terms of treatment options. You do want to, um, you know, uh, be be mindful of the temperatures uh, that exist when you're when you're utilizing it. Um, but uh, but you know, not many not many other uh, negatives regarding uh, the use of of uh, a Formic Pro. So. Um, I never treat, uh, and typically don't have to treat in consecutive months, but I would never use something, uh, the same treatment in consecutive months. So I do have HopGuard 3 available if I need to, uh, if I need to use it. Uh, HopGuard is, uh, is also very advantageous because you can use it with Honey Supers on. However, um, unlike Formic Pro, it does not penetrate brood cappings, so you just have to be mindful of that. So, you know, maybe better to use that um, at a time when there's not not an excessive amount of brood present. Uh, the, one of the, the, that's one of the big advantages of Formic Pro and why we use it um, when, the, when the colonies are, are really uh, ramping up in population. Okay, so uh, that said, I think, uh, um, we can uh, approach the hive that we're going to um, that we're going to be talking about today and taking a look at. Quick little um, background on this particular on this particular hive and why you know I'm kind of I chose it and, and, and interested r right now to see what we're gonna what we're gonna find. About uh, it was about 30 days ago, uh, I was in this hive and you know it, it had there were eggs, there was brood. Um, was was kind of excited about the way it looked and again this was a split from May and um, population was good and uh, bringing a lot of resources in and then uh, as I was going through I noticed that there were a couple of um, a couple of supersedure cells um, you know mid frame uh, down in the uh, in the lower box so <clears throat> Um, I thought that was interesting, you know, things up until that point look great. So I'm like, you know, the, depend on the girls, they know what they're doing. So there may have been a reason why they, you know, were not happy. There's obviously a reason why they weren't happy with the performance of that current queen, which was a young queen because it was, uh, uh, it, it was the, they had, um, uh, she, she was, uh, raised from existing eggs uh, that were present when I did the split. So uh, at that point, you know, about like I say, about 30 days ago, there, uh, when I saw the supersedure cells, there were about ready to be capped. Uh, there were uh, there were two that I noticed, um, pretty well developed larva and ready to be capped. So I, uh, at that point, decided I was gonna close it up and let them do their thing. So um, I have not been in this hive since. And just to, as a reminder, I'm in, I go in, I inspect my hives, uh, the interior of the hives every 10 to 14 days. So it's been hard for me not to go and look, but when I, I certainly would not uh, treat during this time period uh, for mites and I, and I just wanted to leave them alone and let them, um, and let them, uh, let them do their, uh, let them do their thing. I, I want to uh, quick mention, um, I know that I mentioned our, our, our treatment methods for, uh, for Varroa, but I think I failed to mention uh, uh, cultural methods. And the reason why that just popped in my head is because I did bring out a, a drone frame from uh, a hive, one of my over, you know, overwintered hives. And I did want to show you um, you know, this is uh, part of our, one of our cultural methods for varroa control. Um, strictly a, a drone frame. And um, once the majority of the frame 
is the 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 uh, cells are capped. I pull it and freeze it, and then you know for a few days, and then I give it back. Uh, I give it back to the colony, and they clean it out, and we start over again. So um, this is a cultural method that I use on all my hives except uh, except the very first year hives. Um, so a cultural method along with the treatment. Uh, the the treatment methods that I mentioned earlier. Um, also, all of these hives have screen bottom boards, um, and uh, that allows for mites to be shed, the bees to shed some mites. Uh, they fall through the screen and effectively isolating them from the colony. So um, uh, that, on top of you know um, brood breaks from splitting hives, um, uh, along with our treatment methods, that pretty much takes care of, uh, you know, the, uh, completes our approach to, uh, 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 the, our IPM approach to varroa management. Okay. I'm going to get, uh, my valve on and we'll approach our hive. So as I was saying, this, uh, this particular hive is a split from May, and I have not been in it in 30 days, approximately 30 days since I saw those supersedure cells. So what I'm hoping to see is What I'm hoping to see as we open this up is uh, um, some evidence that that in fact they did supersede the uh, queen that they weren't happy with, and that uh, at this point, after 30, approximately 30 days, we should have eggs and uh, and, and possibly some cat brood uh, present if all things uh, if things went well. So let's take a look at the at the hive entrance. Uh, always really um, good to approach from the side or from behind. You know, we're about to open up the hive. We don't need to disturb uh, uh, the girls any more than we need to. So just looking uh, down at the hive entrance, um, you see some guard bees that are uh, um, waiting to greet any, any visitors or hive members. And uh, uh, there's not... I could tell you earlier today, there's a lot of uh, a lot of pollen coming in, a lot of goldenrod and loose stripe, especially some thistle. Um, not a lot coming in, you know, right at the moment. Uh, I don't see uh, in terms of uh, in terms of on the ground uh, or in front of the hive. I don't see any dead bees. Um, I can I I can tell you that um, there were a few uh, drones. Um, being dragged out of some of the other hives this morning, not this particular hive. Um, so here comes a, we have one girl coming in with some some pollen right here. She just landed below the board. Um, so um, we've got goldenrod, jewelweed, and um, loose strife. Um, uh, that's the majority of, uh, of, of what's been coming in. A few weeks back, we still had some, uh, we had some raspberry, some blackberry pollen coming in. Um, and, uh, but, you know, right now, a little quiet on, 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 uh, in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of the amount of pollen coming in. Okay, you'll see that I've been, uh, I've been, uh, I've been providing some, uh, uh, some sugar syrup for this hive, as uh, um, since since it was created actually, um, and uh, um, I'll continue feeding the sugar syrup. We don't take any honey from our first year hive, so um, we let them keep everything that they produce. But uh, I'll feed right until the point where. Uh, 
um, uh, it's just too cold enough to utilize to, to feed sugar syrup uh, uh, anymore. So, that's off. Actually, looks like these girls are kind of calm. Let's see what the population looks like. I don't expect this to be uh, as populated as some of the other hives right now, um, considering that we uh, we may have uh, gone a, while, uh, a month or so without um, without uh, uh, a laying queen. You always want to be mindful. Um, I try to rem I try to remind myself to be mindful of the queen when I'm uh, taking a hive apart. Um, especially, I've seen I've seen queens on the underside of the cover of the outer cover. I've seen them on the inner cover. Um, you really want to be careful to make sure that you're you're kind of mindful of where the where the queen might uh, might be. Okay, so these first couple uh, frames, you know, there's really nothing happening with these. Uh, there's nothing drawn on them, so I'm just pushing them to the side. This next one we have uh, is pretty thick with um, uh, with uh, probably honey slash nectar sugar syrup. I'll pull that out just to take a look at. So as we get towards the interior of the hive, you know, I'll uh, I'm. I'm keeping my fingers crossed as to what we're <laughs> what we're gonna see, but this is a very very heavy frame. All this is this is all new wax, all new comb, um, and like I say, this could be uh, mostly sugar syrup that's actually that they've uh, that they've actually put up, um, but regardless. Um, you know, a nice frame, very heavy, loaded with um, resources there. You'll also see um, on this side, very similar with also uh, in this area down on the bottom, you see a lot of uh, different colored pollen. Okay, so we'll put this, we'll put this back in. Let's see. Okay, so now we have another, we have an arc of, of um, capped honey or syrup. And also, let's look a little closer. We might, we may have uh, struck gold. Let's see if we can see, uh, right? You can see um, towards the, let me cut this down. So you'll see some nurse bees hanging out in the middle here. Um, in, the, in the center area, there's some uh, uh, recently, looks like recently hatched larva. And also if we look over to where my, uh, I'm pointing in this particular area, uh, we see some uh, fresh eggs. So that makes me uh, very happy. That, that tells me that the uh, supersedure process succeeded. And you know, as I'm getting older, it's not always real easy for me to see eggs that easily, but you know, if I can see them a couple feet away, um, that, uh, that's, a great, that's a great sign. And right in there, a really good view of some freshly 
laid eggs. And <clears throat> I also am happy with the amount of royal jelly that I see um, present. I realize there's not a ton of pollen coming in right at the moment, but there's enough pollen that they've been bringing in um, to generate a fair amount of royal jelly uh, to raise to raise their young. Let's take a look at one more frame up in this top box before we go look down below. And another very heavy, very heavy frame loaded with honey, nectar, pollen in those cells below the honey. So I see, uh, you know, we're seeing plenty of uh, plenty of nurse bees. Uh, I'm not. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen the queen to yet, which I really don't expect to. Uh, I haven't seen any drones yet either. All right. Twenty-six. Now. That's. I am actually uh, pretty happy with knowing that our colony um, did raise a new queen and that she's been laying. Now I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any cat brood yet, but we know that in, in uh, a few days down the road that will, that will change. If I come back in here, you know, in a, in a week, there's going to be a lot of cat brood up in this top box so right now you know i wouldn't add any uh i would not add a super here i've only, i've got five um drawn frames um and five that haven't really been touched yet so we're gonna uh, just keep uh we'll just keep feeding the uh, sugar syrup um as uh the fall goes on and we're you know we just came out of a dearth so we will have uh um uh, we should be entering a period where there are uh, plenty of resources available for them for the next month and hopefully we'll be able to fill that box out. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go down into our next box. Let's take a look at a few frames down here. <clears throat> okay. Girls are all uh, are pretty calm. Population, you know, at this point, I'd say is you know a little uh, below average, um, especially in comparison to some of the other hives. And that's because they just simply, uh, you know, if they went through a super procedure process, they've had a uh, they've had a time period uh, where they have not had any uh, any uh, um, replacement bees. You know, coming in for those that have uh, have um, um, that have passed. So um, let's take a look at a few of. Them. <clears throat> I'm gonna go in for this side this time. I know we have an empty frame here, so we'll take that one out. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, um, the uh, what I'm seeing from the adults, uh, no sign of any of any brood disease. There's no sign of like a K wing or um, deformed wing virus uh, or um, uh, certainly no evidence of. Uh, like a parasitic mite syndrome there's no evidence of uh of uh you know i don't see any crawling or um twitching bees that would indicate a pesticide poisoning event um here you can see you know a lot of we've got an arc here of honey and and a tremendous amount of pollen and nectar um below so 
they have still been busy even though they haven't been producing a lot of bees let's see what hopefully hopefully we're gonna see some more um, brood that will appear as we go through here um, I do want to say um, in terms of here we'll see a lot of pollen there are some uh, there's some larva right in the uh, in the center area. There's actually some cat brood um, that we see in the middle, so um, that's a very good sign. Not a lot of cat brood on this one, but there are but there is cat brood and a lot of uh, very colored pollens uh, that you see. A lot of bee bread, so the resources are actually looking pretty good. We see just trying to see if we can find a drone. I did not see a drone. Still do not see a drone. You know, it would he'd stand out like they'd stand out like a sore thumb. They're uh stout, a little clumsy looking, kind of remind you of a bumblebee. Okay, now well, here looks like we've got a couple nice frames of brood. Very nice. So there we see um, very nice frame of cat brood. Great laying pattern from the queen. So the new new queen is definitely doing well. Let me look at here. Center area filled with cat brood as you as you move away from the cappings, you'll see, you know, larva that's getting ready to be capped and then gradually getting younger as you move away uh, to the youngest of the larva, eventually, um, you know, yielding to um, some pollen bee bread along, along the outer perimeter. So, uh, we'll get one more here before we look to wrap things up. Okay, so here we've got um, an old, well, there's an old queen, what I would call a queen cup now. If you can see, there's nothing in there, but that, in fact, may have been the cell that was used as a supersedure cell for the current queen. I don't see any, there's certainly no swarm cells present. There's, uh, um, we do have some, we do have some uh, drone, uh, <clears throat> drone brood over just in this particular area. Some bullet shaped drone brood so uh they are going to be there should be a few drones coming appearing soon but not not right yet <laughs> so i see you know no evidence of any brood disease you know i if no sign of and i've never had an issue with sack brood or chalk brood or um uh, or thank God, no European or American fowl brood. Um, you know, we'd see a very spotty um, uh, um, pattern in the brood, and the brood cell wouldn't be consistent and full like you see it. Um, and uh, it looks healthy. You know, there's no odd smell that, you know, I notice. Um, and... You know, this is just full of, of nectar and and uh, and uh, and pollen, a bee bird. Burr comb there, and you know, uh, so for the amount of bees that are in here, they've actually done a pretty good job. But it's obvious that they're a little low population-wise right now. Uh, again, there's no sign of uh, there is no sign of brood disease, um, no sign of a uh, of uh, a parasitic mite syndrome, no sign of hygienic behavior 
uh, where they're pulling um, pulling uh, pupa out that, that are diseased and um, and no perforated cappings. So um, it, to me, the, the, the colony looks pretty healthy at this point in time. Um, there's a significant amount of, uh, of honey and, uh, and pollen present. Uh, certainly entering, uh, coming out of a dearth and entering a, um, and entering a, uh, the fall flow, the goldenrod flow, they should be able to put up um, some more resources and be, be in good shape for winter. Um, the, uh, in terms of nutrition, you know, uh, healthy brood, healthy colonies are a result of good genetics, um, uh, excellent nutrition, and, um, and, uh, and proper hive management. And that means being in your hives and inspecting on a uh, consistent basis um, and, uh, um, and acting when you, when you, when you see something. So, um, right now, you know, we're, uh, um, there's not a lot for me to do, um, as we, as I start to close this hive up, but I certainly am going to keep, uh, feeding. I'm switching to a, uh, two to one concentration, um, as we, as we get into the fall. Um, next, now I, I have held, I've held off on doing any mite monitoring um for uh, uh this past month so we're definitely due to do a sugar shake i'm going to since this is a new queen i am going to let her you know i'm going to let her do her thing for another week i'll do a sugar shake in about in a week and then we'll uh we'll we'll treat accordingly you know if we have to i'd rather i hopefully will be in a situation where i don't have to treat i i i'd, I'd hate to have to disrupt the colony um at, at that point but um so we're we're tr in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, next steps. It's uh, it, with this particular hive. It's simply keep feeding, monitoring, monitoring for mites, and uh, you know once as winter approaches, we'll winterize and you know get them get them well situated uh, for winter. Um, Again, nutrition-wise, the uh, the uh, honey is the honey provides the carb the, the carbohydrates which um, fuel the activities of the colony and would fuel the activities of the colony, um, but it's the pollen. That provides the protein and nutrients that are so crucial for colony uh, health and brood development. Now, I we saw plenty of royal jelly in there, so um, you know we may not see a lot of pollen coming in now, but they're bringing enough pollen in. Uh, to produce uh, copious amounts of, of royal jelly. So, in closing, I think, uh, um, you know, I've, I've gone through the next steps. It's not in need of any immediate, um, uh, in, in terms of any immediate action, um, you know, it really is not in need of any. She, the, the queen was superseded. It looks like the original queen. Um, the reason why I say she, I'm confident that she was superseded um, is that at the time, and that I was looking at supersedure cells a month ago is that at that time there was uh, there were eggs present and some cat brood 30 days ago 
um, but there were the supersedure cells present. So for whatever reason, the, um, the, the colony wasn't, wasn't content with the, um, with the queen that was um, present at that time. And it looks as though they superseded her and it looks as though they superseded her uh, successfully. So the colony overall looks pretty healthy. I see no evidence of brood disease. Uh, the adults look good. We did not see uh, we did not see a drone, which is amazing. But <laughs> we did not see a drone. But again, the drone would be stout and uh, almost you know kind of clumsy looking and bumblebee like and uh, in his actions. And the uh, uh, and if we saw the queen, we know she's there. We saw eggs, so we know she's queen right. Uh, we know the hive's queen right, um, and we saw fresh eggs. And uh, if we did see the queen, she would stand out. We'd see that elongated, um, at pointed abdomen, um, and uh, she would stick out like a, like a sore thumb. But um, that said, um, I think that uh, um, I, I do want to just finish off by saying, you know, last winter we had 100% uh, overwintering success. All of our hives made it through the winter. And... Um, you know, I can't remember the last time that happened, and I just want to thank uh, the Cornell Master Beekeeping Program for helping me to achieve that. So um, this has been a great, uh, a, a great learning experience for me, and uh, and um, I hope that uh, I hope that everyone has a great uh, fall uh, and uh, um, honey uh, extraction season. And uh, thanks very much. I hope this was informative and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.